I want the mic. I want, I want to thank Chairman Simpson, who is our representative, for his continued efforts on behalf of the Shoshone-Bannock tribes and for his efforts on salmon recovery for the Snake River. Thank you. My written testimony includes several issues of great importance to the tribe, including the need for more funding for the Johnson O'Malley Program, BIA Road Maintenance, Wildlife Conservation, and Wildland Fire Programs as well as the need to maintain advanced appropriations for the Indian Health Service in the FY24 appropriations. But today, I will focus on one, the Gay Mine Superfund site located on our reservation, BIE teacher salaries, and the need for a comprehensive approach to the opioid epidemic. <clears throat> the Gay Mine was an open pit phosphate mine that operated between 1946 and 1993. Ultimately, the mine would cover 7,000 acres of reservation land with 158 pits, each ranging in size from 15 to 20 acres, many with high walls of 50 feet or more and many with contaminated pit lakes. There are also 57 mill shell piles with over 30 million tons of overburden. The original lease in 1946 stated that Simplot would return the land in, quote, as good condition as received, unquote. This did not happen when the mine closed in 1993, and 30 years later, this has still not happened. Over the past 30 years, minimal reclamation work to make the land usable again has occurred, and only recently has environmental remediation work started to address the contamination caused by the mine. While the EPA remediation process is underway, the tribe would like to lead a strategic study to plan the reclamation of the site in order to utilize the area for future development of the tribe. When Gay Mine was leased in 1940, the tribes never thought that when the mine closed, we would never be able to use the land again. We again ask for your help in reclaiming our reservation land by di directing the BLM and BIA to work with the tribe to undertake a strategic reclamation study of Gay Mine. Turning to the need for more BIE teach funding for the BIE teacher salaries, the current funding levels prevent providing competitive salaries for qualified teachers at the Shoshone Bannock Junior Senior High School which is a tribally controlled BIE school on the reservation. Right now, the only way our school can compete on teacher salaries with local schools in Idaho is to use carryover funding, over 146,000 this school year. Over the last two weeks, the school has been closed for four days due to a lack of certified teachers. This is not sustainable for the school. While the BIE has informed the school that additional funding was provided and the school should be following the BIE teacher's salary schedule, the school is simply not receiving enough funding to meet the BIE teacher school teacher schedule. As a result, the school is having great difficulty in recruiting and retaining high qualified certified teachers as well as having funding to provide a guidance counselor and a school resource officer. We urge the subcommittee to hold an oversight hearing on the BIE and to increase funding for teacher salaries. Finally, I want to make an urgent plea to the subcommittee to help us address the opioid, opioid epidemic that our community is facing. In the past two weeks alone, we have lost four tribal members to overdose. There is simply not enough funding for prevention and treatment. The tribes lack any suitable detox center or treatment facility on the reservation, limiting the ability of those in need to get treatment. Further, the lack of enforcement and prosecution of non-Indians on the reservation by the federal government is making the reservation a haven for drug dealers. We need immediate assistance to combat this issue. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Donna. Keenan. <coughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Simpson and uh, Listen, member Bingus. Oh. There you go. Good afternoon, Chairman Simpson, Ranking Member Pingree, and the members of the subcommittee. My name is Keenan Grosbeck, and I'm a member of the Northern Rapco 
uh, tribe, and I'm a business councilman from Wyoming. <coughs> and uh, I'll come here to speak on behalf of the uh, Native American church and the uh, Peyote habitat that's being lost, you know. And uh, I'll come before you guys today, and uh, I want to thank you for your time, you know, to hear us out, you know. And uh, we're here as a um, representative for the uh, Native American church, you know. Uh, I participate and run uh, ceremonies as a uh, uh, tribal leader for the uh, Northern Rapo tribe, you know. And uh, the, the issue that we have now is the uh, decline of the habitat for the, uh, the uh, Peyote Kafka, and it's a holy sacrament to our Native American church. And uh, we're, we're coming before the subcommittee here to ask for some funding, you know, to uh, help uh, the decline of the habitat. And uh, through, through, through the efforts by us sustaining, sustaining the, um, the peyote habitat, it's going to uh, sustain a way of life, you know, that we have as uh, Native American peoples throughout Indian, Indian country, you know. And uh, we're a uh, Northern Rapo tribe, or a few of the uh, bona fide tribes that practice the Native American church way of life, you know. And uh, it would be detrimental, uh, it's going to be detrimental to our people and other people for the hassle, uh, the loss of the habitat for the uh, peyote cactus, you know. And uh, we're here to ask the subcommittee here for uh, um, allocations of uh, funds, you know, to uh, pay the private landowners in uh, southwest Texas, Laredo area, for the uh, habitat for the uh, peyote that grows there. And uh, through... Um, development of uh, energy and uh, roads and uh, construction and everything, you know, the, the habitat is being lost at an alarming rate, you know, and, and uh, we're here to uh, put the markers up and uh, I'll have you guys look into that, you know, to see some, uh, some more federal oversight on that, on the issue of the peyote habitat loss, you know, and um, for myself, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty scary time for uh, our Indian people, you know, because uh, we depend on this way of life, you know, this way of worship, you know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's to the core of our people, you know, how, how we get along with one another and how we support one another, and uh, it'll, it'll, it'll really hurt our tribe uh, enormously, you know, if we, if, if we was to uh, not have the peyote to use as a uh, holy sacrament in our Native American church, you know. So on that, you know, um, we, uh, we're just asking for some uh, stability into the uh, habitat so we, so we don't lose it. And uh, that's what I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And next we have Quincy. That's lahain. Ini munik to ask Chayokum. It goes up with Timki, Quincy Ellenwood. I'm known to my people, the uh, Nimipu, the Nez Perce people, as Chayokum, after the late John Miller of uh, Clear Creek, Idaho. And um, as I'm currently serving on the Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee as the treasurer, and I'm also the Natural Resource uh, uh, Chairman. I also sit on Human Resources, Law and Order, and uh, Land Commission. I wanted to tell you all, thank you very much for your time today. and. It's an honor to be to be here to testify on behalf of um, my Nespers people. Um, although I want to only summarize a few of the uh, recommendations contained, you know, in this written testimony, I hope that you will fully respect the request of the subcommittee and the recommendations made by the Nespers Nation, and also those from the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission for your uh, during your deliberations for FY24. I want to also give a big um, testimony towards our Indian Health Indian Health Services for the fiscal year 24 and increased appropriations on a bipartisan basis to the multitude of programs under your jurisdiction, which tribal nations administer and benefit from. Funding increases to tribal um, programs, including the fiscal year 23 budget build on and, and increases secured uh, through Indian country in FY22, we want to say thank you. The Nez Perce Tribe does a tremendous amount of work administering programs with the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Indian Health Services, and the Environmental Protection Agency, 
under 638 programs and direct services. The federal funding for this work benefits uh, tribal and non-tribal citizens within the exterior boundaries of the Nez Perce Indian Reservation. It is very important to protecting the treaty reserved uh, resources to the, to the Nez Perce tribe and, and the tribe urges you to continue the funding of these programs to the, to the fullest extent. The Nez Perce tribe, we have uh, um, our own law enforcement and social services are two of the larger uh, departments that the tribe administers. Currently, the tribe, um, well, we have to subsidize our law enforcement program to ensure services are provided throughout the Nez Perce Indian Reservation. In addition, we have uh, constructed our own jail facility and, and financed all this on for the Nez Perce tribe because of the uh, lack of uh, cooperation with some of the local jail facilities in the five counties that we have on the Nez Perce Indian Reservation. So we would uh, greatly appreciate advocacy for, for, for more funding through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Indian Affairs Natural Resource Tribal Priority Allocations and Endangered Species Program funding. This is funding, this funding is key for our work related to um, salmon, the toch in our language and the steelhead. And also the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, Rights Protection Implementation Account has also been critical in supporting our exercise of treaty reserved <coughs> rights on and off the reservation in protecting hunting and fishing and monitoring our fish harvest. In addition to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the, uh, the tribe operates in a health care facility which provides um, services to over 4,000 4, um, Nez Perce and non Nez Perce. This uh, computes to over 40,000 medical provider visits and we have a health, the main health care facility is in Lapway, Idaho with the satellite facility in Kamiya. Uh, to my people is Mutalima first and then Kamiya second. The tribe's funding through the Environmental Protection Agency comes from a variety of programs, the Clean Water Act, Indian General Assistance Program, the Clean Water Act, just to name a few. And remember that these programs have been funded at the same levels for several years and the tribe would uh, recommend increase in the FY24. Uh, the Nimipua River salmon people, and uh, we also travel to uh, Buffalo Country. Since time immemorial, we have uh, fished in the Columbia, Columbia and the Snakes and the Clearwater Rivers. The tribe requests that th this subcommittee continue the EPA's um, Columbia River Basin Restoration Program. We recommend that no no less than three million provided for fiscal year 23 be appropriated for 24. Uh, we also work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in uh, operation of the Kuski National Fish Hatchery, which is uh, a neighboring to where I grew up on the Clear Creek. It was a tributary of the Clearwater River. The tribe manages the hatchery uh, and, uh, and the Snake River Rights in the Act of 2004. The hatchery is in dire need of new water supply and the extraordinary amount of sediment and uh, accumulates in the current water that is feeding the Kuski National Fish Hatchery. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service should be uh, allocated adequate funding for the operations and importance and in, in O&M of this hatchery facility. Also, the state and tribal uh, wildlife grant programs has enabled the tribe to monitor gray wolves, uh, conduct research on bighorn and co uh, California condor habitat, and conserve rare, rare plants. The tribe does a tremendous amount of work with the Forest Service and we just recently um, signed a, a good neighbor, a GNA, good neighbor authority. And we work with um, 12 different nas national um, forests that we deal with on fishing, hunting, and exercising our way of life, which is now considered a treaty. In closing, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your time. It's an honor to be in, in your presence. And also your uh, your your attention to missing and, missing and <coughs> excuse me, missing murdered indigenous woman um, needs more and more advocacy. And I stand with it and I will do the best I can to always protect uh, the givers and takers of life, our women folks. Thank you. Thank you. It's the right word that you say it's an honor to be here. You know what? 
it's an honor it's an honor for us to have you here to have the our Indian brothers and sisters and tribal elders to be to, to come and testify it's an honor for us truthfully so thank you all for being here I've really uh, enjoyed working with the Nez Perce tribe on trying to save the salmon in the Snake River we're gonna get it done it's gonna take some time something you've been working on for years. I'm a latecomer to it, but we've been working very hard with your tribe uh, and with the, with the Shoshone Bannock tribe and all the tribes along the Snake River in Columbia uh, to try to restore these salmon. And it's hard to do, it's controversial, it's gonna take some changes to the way, to the way we're doing things right now. But uh, I appreciate working with you on that and the other things that, uh, that you've done on the Nez Perce uh, Reservation that the tribes have done. So great work, uh, Donna. Have any of those high walls come down yet? Nope. None? Zero? I, I told him, give me some dynamite, you know? <laughs> I, it, uh, I enjoyed our tour uh, up there, and it is such beautiful country that it does need to get restored to its original, uh, original state, and we've got to make that happen. And as I said it, as I said at the time, I don't know what it's going to take, but it's going to take the cooperation of all sides. And uh, I was hoping that uh, the company, uh, Simplot, and the tribes could get together and and come to some resolution to start working on this, because it's got to get done, and it's just getting more expensive as as we wait. So I look forward to working with you on that. And you bring up, uh, you know, I I didn't know that we were having trouble keeping teachers because of low pay on the reservation versus higher pay in Blackfoot and Pocatello, I suspect. I knew that that was a problem that I brought up earlier, in fact, in another panel, with police officers and firemen. Yep. I didn't know that that was the case with teachers also. That's something that I, I don't have the answer to that, but it's something we gotta work on. It is an issue that not just affects tribes, but I noticed when I was a city councilman in Blackfoot, we would train all the police officers and firemen for Pocatello and Idaho Falls, <laughs> bigger cities, you know, and as soon as they got trained, they'd go there where they could pay more. Well, the tribes, it's the same problem with the tribes. They're, they are the training grounds for the police and firemen in the larger cities that, that really are on the, on the borders of uh, the Fort Hall Indian Reservation. But I find that that's true across the country. Uh, I don't have the answer to that, but it, I brought it up with several individuals, and it's something that I think we need to work on uh, uh, very seriously. So I look forward to working with you on that and trying to, trying to address that, uh, that uh, problem. But uh, uh, as you know, I've always, always been thrilled to work with, uh, with show bands on issues that they, that they have out there. I sat one day in a classroom where they were teaching Bannock language to a bunch of youngsters, you know, and to sit and listen to them. And anyway, that's, you know, we can't lose our languages of our, of our Native American tribes in this country. We have to find a way to maintain those languages and stuff. I mean, it, we, have to weigh, we have to find a way to maintain those cultures. I just said when I got, a, I got an award from Rivers uh, American Rivers the other night. And I said, you know, I've been working with the tribes on saving salmon. And I told them, this was at their reception, I said, you know what? I said, there's a wisdom there that we don't take advantage of with our Native American tribes. Sometimes we take it too lightly something we need to listen to and learn from. So I appreciate you being all, all of you being here today. Where are, the, where are you located? Wyoming. Central Wyoming. Central, that's yeah. right. Okay, yeah. Uh, Ms. Pingree. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, your, your thoughts there, and also your commitment to restoring Salmon River is also a main issue, yeah. and um, as you said, it's it's not easy. It's often controversial, and it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of time. But it's particularly important, I think, um, where tribal communities have the salmon rights. It's really 
extremely important. So, so thank you for that. And um, we've learned a little bit about the disappearance of native peyote today, and so I'm interested to keep learning more about that and and seeing what we need to do to um, help preserve those areas where it is growing. Um, and lastly, uh, just tell me a little bit more, I, and I don't have to take up too much time about this, but so how has it taken so long? If that was 93, and there's still a company actively involved, you said Simplot and FMC, um, and it's a potential or is a Superfund site, w what is the barrier here to, like, how did they walk away in 93 and not do any of the cleanup? And then I'm pretty sure my calculation is it's 30 years now, right? Well, it has been good. You yep. could have a long All right. I may have to just <laughs> buy the chair, drink sometime, and hear the whole story. But uh, it, it just seems like we need to do more. And you're, you're not the only uh, cleanup site or Superfund site we've heard about from tribes today. It's just. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Visualize it. No, thank you. Um, anything that can happen to help us, that would be very well received. All right, I'll try to learn more about it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, M Ms. Thompson, is there a school shortage of teachers in Idaho that you're aware of? I mean, because I think there's a national problem with people not going into teaching. Yes, there is. Um, but however, because our pay scale is lower than the yeah. states, we have, then we have a hard time. <coughs> and then you have issues with housing and where yeah. people live and if you're married and you have a spouse that works and, yeah. and that. But I was, I, I, I think as we hear about this, there's also, I'm a former teacher, there's, there, there is going to be a real crunch for, for teachers in general, and if we don't get this fixed, you're always going to be behind. Yeah, um, Councilmember uh, Gosback. Uh, so I want to understand your journey. So you're in Wyoming <coughs> now. Yeah. The Peyotes in Texas. Yeah. So we, we tell me your journey. We as a tribe, we, we, we can call it. We can call it three years. You know, put on the certificate. And So were, were there other tribes that also went there? I mean, in Minnesota we have Pipestone, so yeah, tribes yeah. traveled for Pipestone. So this is just not an issue for your tribe. Are there any, are th um, and I can find out more about this later, but are there any uh, tribes where that was ancestral homeland, where maybe the federal government and tribes together could work to, you know, purchase back some of the, the land or something like that? Tribes, there, there is some, uh, some tribes that were down there. I, I only think it maybe been six months, maybe five months. Okay. So there would be many who would benefit yeah. for something like that. And um, Treasurer Elwood, uh, I really appreciated the way that you talked about the whole of government, not just in the interior bill. What, so, you know, when, you, when um, Forest Service isn't plussed up and Fish and Wildlife isn't plussed up in the right lines and you aren't plussed up, it's a multiplying effect of almost like a death by a thousand little cuts. You're not able to move forward. 
Anything you want to expand about how you're, you, there, there's, there are the lines that go directly to your tribe, but then there's all the other lines that go to other things that M Mr. Simpson and Ms. Pingree will be funding that your tribe draws from. Could you just expand on that a little more? <clears throat> so yeah, I, I, there's a lot of, um, we do a lot of work through the Forest Service, you know, with um, th through the culverts replacement, salmon habitat, and, and particularly it would be really beneficial hugely to um, everybody be on, on the same page to protect, to protect each other's work. You know, for instance, water quality. You know, uh, we have water quality issues in the, um, in the uh, South Fork, uh, in the South Fork area, South Fork of the Salmon. And uh, so, you know, there's a huge um, a mining site to be proposed there. And there's also many other to protect that, to, to protect each other's work that ultimately come through the tribe and to to have the advocacy that we have, you know, um, above all, you know, it, it, it takes a team. Teamwork makes the dream work. And ultimately, I'm making, you know, we have a right to live our lives as God has created us. And as you said, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, we, there's a lot. I urge you all to come out and visit Indian country, uh, Nez Perce country, any other tribe that's out there, because you, you said, Mr. Chairman, there's um, a huge wisdom that's there. We have uh, we have a right to live our lives as the way God created us. And when we have um, pandemics like this, when people pass, a lot of sometimes that history is, is gone. So I urge you, as, as the way it's taught to myself, to, to teach it, to learn it, to observe it, to feel it. I urge you to come out and do the same along with us. It's a beautiful way of life. Very, very beautiful way of life. Um, That's interesting. Ah, there it stayed on. Yeah, and we're going to do a little more traveling up around, uh, and I'd like to get out to the Pacific Northwest and I'd like down to the uh, southern part of this country where we haven't really spent any time down Mississippi and and uh, Alabama and those places. So I, we're going to be looking at uh, some of these places that we can, can visit because I think, as I said earlier today, that it's important that we actually get out and see where you live and uh, the challenges that you face and stuff. So I thank all of you for being here today. Uh, let me ask you one question, Keenan. Uh, yes, is South Texas the only place that peyote grows? No, it grows across the border. Well, I'm not sure I want to do that, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but its its habitat is very small, huh? So you couldn't take it up and say, I'm going to grow it in Wyoming or... <laughs> Pretty rough, huh? Yeah, yeah. That'd be like Maine trying to grow potatoes, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I just get a shot in every time I do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all for being here today, and thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Okay, Stephen Rowe Lewis, uh, Governor of the Gila uh, River Indian Community, Tahisa Hill, uh, Chairman of the Oneida Nation, and John Johnson, President of the Lac de Flambeau uh, Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. They just called votes. Uh, let's do. Uh, let's at least listen to one person before we go. We're going to be interrupted in the middle of this. We'll hear the first. Uh, Testimony from uh, Stephen Rolus, and uh, then we've got to go vote real quick. I think it's two votes. Yep. We have two votes, and then we'll be back and continue, okay? So, Stephen, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Skook Tosh, Anya Apchugat, and Governor Stephen Rolus of the Gila River Indian Community. Chairman Simpson and Ranking Member Pingree, Congresswoman McCollum, and the committee, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today on behalf and also uh, Congress, Congressman Elzey as well. 
Thank you for providing testimony, um, uh, for allowing me to provide testimony on behalf of the Gila River Indian community. Now today, I have two requests. First, funding to implement the, sur the surveying of federal rights of way on our community's reservation, Chairman, which is required under legislation unique to the community. Second, mandatory funding for the Indian Self-Determination Act's Section 105L program, which will benefit Indian country as a whole. And I want to thank uh, the Congresswoman McCollum for being such a champion from the beginning on the 105L. In 2018, Congress approved the Gila River Indian Community's Federal Rights of Way Easement and Boundary Clarification Act. This act was necessary to enable the community to obtain the full benefits of the settlement that the community reached with the United States to resolve litigation that was filed in 2006. The act requires that all federal rights of way on the community's reservation be surveyed within six years of enactment of the law, subject to appropriations. So at the time the act was passed, the estimated funding needed to complete these surveys was approximately $15.5 million. Since the act became law, the community has requested $3 million annually to ensure the completion of this work within the six-year time frame. Now we're in the fifth year since enactment and only $1 million has been appropriated to date. And if annual appropriations continue in the $1 million range, it'll take another 14 years, Chairman, to fully implement a settlement that began with litigation in 2006. Now the community entered into this settlement in good faith with the United States and Congress passed this act in good faith as well. But unless appropriations are consistently awarded in the amounts needed to complete implementation of the act, that good faith will be breached uh, to, to all of the community members and chairman, leaving the community with an unresolved portion of its settlement. So today, I'm asking this committee to allocate a minimum of $3 million to implement this legislation so the community can begin uh, the good work in earnest as intended when the act was passed in 2018. Now, my second request addresses mandatory funding for sovereign tribal nation obligations under Section 105L of the Indian Self-Determination Act. Today and tomorrow, you will hear uh, from my fellow tribal leaders across Indian country uh, that you will hear a consistent theme, the need for improved or newly constructed facilities for schools, law enforcement, healthcare, natural resources, and administrative functions. Now, Congress has already developed a solution to those infrastructure needs for a majority of Indian country. In 2018, I sat in this chair before this committee and proposed a pilot construction program, a program that would allow the community to design and construct a new school and then lease that school facility back to the Department of the Interior under Section 105L authority. You took a chance on that program then, and we were able to construct that school less expensively and in half the time that it would have taken the federal government. Now, since that time, the community has successfully utilized, moved this program forward to construct a second school. And last fall, we broke ground on a new police department. We have hosted tribes across Indian country to learn about this program, to show them that this program works. And with the support of this committee and the past two administrations, the program has indeed grown. The funding for the program has also grown in acknowledgement of this innovative approach to meet the needs of Indian country. The funding has been elevated from pilot funding to line item funding to indefinite funding. Now the next critical step to ensure that the program can be implemented to its full capacity and in compliance with the statutory mandates under the Indian Self-Determination Act and subsequent court cases is for the funding to become mandatory. Now I want to note that this mandatory funding will not necessarily help my community. Our construction program is well underway and we have entered into leases on our eligible existing facilities. Uh, but with help with any rehabilitation and repair needed um, on those buildings. That will help, definitely. But this funding will help Indian country by allowing the program to reach the potential anticipated by this committee. Now, mandatory funding will provide the mechanism needed to encourage the public-private partnership, that component of this program, by providing the capital needed 
for tribes to construct facilities which is required before leases can be negotiated with the administration. Now this program that I'm describing is the embodiment, I believe, of the intent of the Indian Self-Determination Act to empower tribes to make decisions regarding the scope and type of facilities needed to carry out our governmental responsibilities to our members. I ask you to finish the job and to make this funding mandatory in line with the sovereign tribal obligations under this act. And also in addition, I echo my fellow tribal leaders on the need to provide resources to tribal nations to address the MMIP issue, the terrible scourge of fentanyl uh, that is sweeping across not only this nation but Indian country as well, and also the necessary behavioral health services that are needed uh, in, throughout Indian country as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you, Stephen. We're going to have to uh, recess the committee uh, to go vote a couple of votes, and then we'll be right back. So have a Coke and a Snicker. And, uh, but I will tell you, Stephen, you, you mentioned in there that there was agreement you signed with the federal government that was subject to appropriations. And you always want to be really careful. Uh, sign an agreement with the federal government that says subject to appropriations because <laughs> sometimes it doesn't come through. <laughs> I appreciate it, but we'll be back in just a few minutes. Committee's in recess.
Whoops. Uh, Dehisha, you're up. Sugoli Sogwek, Dehasidaz in Yungets, Wogaskli Wage, and Yugitaloda, Onyotaga, Igua Hunjoda. Greetings, everyone. I'm Dehasa Hill, Chairman for Oneida Nation. Uh, my, uh, uh, this is the people that I come from. Uh, so, uh, Yonko, thank you, Chairman uh, Simpson and Ranking Member Pingree and, and members of the committee. On behalf of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, I submit the following testimony for the Subcommittee on Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies hearing on Fiscal Year 2024 Annual Appropriations Bill. The agencies and programs involved in the nation's request are the Indian Health Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Indian Health Service funding, I would like to begin my formal remarks by offering the subcommittee and those who serve on the full committee my gratitude uh, from the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin for your efforts to provide advance appropriations to cover Indian Health Services for fiscal year 2024. As you know, providing health security to our members has been a priority for our nation and all Indian country for many years. Your efforts will likely save lives and bring calm to the many who depend on IHS for their services. This was a great step in ensuring the federal government meets its trust and treaty obligations. The next step is full and mandatory funding for IHS. Access to health care is a core element of the federal treaty and trust responsibility. Moving IHS funding from discretionary to mandatory will ensure that the health of our people will no longer be impacted by government shutdowns or delays in the appropriation process. Uh, Long-term care, groundbreaking language giving IHS specific authorities for provisions of long-term care was authorized in the Affordable Care Act. These authorities represented a major step forward for our communities. Unfortunately, while authorized, these services have not been funded. We request Congress fund long-term care in the fiscal year 24 appropriations. The nation has operated a long-term care facility since 1978 and currently operates a 48-bed multi-purpose building that includes skilled nursing, congregate elder meal site, and physical therapy services. Currently, we do not receive IHS funding to provide our long-term care services. Uh, next item is the BIA law enforcement. Our nation's law enforcement program is severely underfunded, even by Indian country standards. We only receive about 4% of our operating budget for criminal investigations. That doesn't even cover payroll for one of our 22 officers. Our funding allocation for public safety is so low because the BIA has chosen not to fund police for tribes in public law 280 states. The Bureau tells us that in public law 280 states like Wisconsin, that the state, not our tribal government, has primary criminal jurisdiction. So we don't need the money, they say. That is wrong. If we don't provide emergency services, for the 27,000 people living across our 102 square mile reservation, no one will. In 2021, our officers made 173, 173 arrests, of which 133 were drug related. We cannot ignore these crimes and just say someone else will handle it. To that end, I ask that you set a minimum allocation of $500,000 for each tribe within the BIA public safety line item. Another item for BIA is uh, the realty service funding. The nation asked appropriations, appropriators to increase funding for equipment to assist and expedite our processes to acquire lands. The BIA's Division of Land Title and Records is to maintain timely certified federal land title ownership records. However, many of these details associated with the work of this office are carried out by tribes on their respective reservations. While the BIA employees are provided with new equipment on a regular basis, tribes being asked to help carry out these programs are failing to receive similar upgrades, or in some instances, even enough computer hardware to carry out their responsibilities. Beyond the lack of support for technology, BIA has an abysmal track record of completing realty transactions in a timely manner. Fee to trust applications for even clear cut examples can take between five and 10 years to complete. Realty transactions on tribal residential, agriculture, and commercial lease properties can take six months to a year, if not longer. Individual trust probates can take at least five years, if not longer. It is clear that BIA's trust and, trust and realty offices are under-resourced and understaffed, and the nation asks Congress to provide funding to rectify these chronic issues. Next section is the EPA funding. We would like 
the committee to know that Oneida Nation takes the protection of our lands and waterways seriously. To that end, we have partnered with the Environmental Protection Agency for many years. However, our resources are stressed, particularly since funding has not increased in 24 years. We have we also take advantage of Section 319 of the Clean Water Act, which partially funds our non-point source program. This program did recently see increase after many years from $30,000 to $36,000 annually. So thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Don? Bonjour, and Doug. Thank you, Chairman Simpson, Ranking Member Pingree, Subcommittee Members and Staff. I'm John Johnson, Senior, the President of the Lacta Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. I'm a second term right now as president and have served the tribal government for about a decade. I'm also the current chairman of the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, Glipwick. I strongly commend to you the work of Glipwick to protect the treaty rights on behalf of the 11 Ojibwe tribes residing in Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Thank you for your invitation to testify regarding the fiscal year 24 budget. I will focus primarily on BIA and IHS. Our small reservation is located north central Wisconsin with lands in southwestern Vilas and Iron Counties. Half of our reservation is lakes. The preservation and protection of our water, land, air are critical to the health and well being of all of our reservation residents. We have an enrollment of 4,141 tribal citizens, roughly one half of our members live on the reservation along with over 1,615 non-residents, non-Indian residents. Our tribe faces many challenges as a rural remote community that must be, m most governmental services ourselves. Drug misuse is high. We are fighting to maintain professional staff and provide them with affordable housing, which we lack on our reservation. That is why federal appropriations to the tribe for the programs we carry out on behalf of the federal government are so important to us. Despite the modest tribal casino, according to the latest data from HUD, we have nearly 700 Native American households that fall well below median family income. In Vilas County, with a population of 25,000 residents, median household income was 57,000 in 2021, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Our median is $17,100 for a family of four. $17,100 is not a living income. Mm -hmm. Many tribal leaders have come before you for decades to repeat a simple truth in most instances. Federal appropriations for Indian tribes spell the difference between the success mm -hmm. failure of federal programs enacted for the benefit of Indian tribes. If our tribal programs succeed, tribal members' lives improve. Funds for scholarships, the Johnson O'Malley program, social services, road maintenance, law enforcement, health care, help tribes provide a healthy and safe environment for our citizens. Since 1975, under the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, Indian tribes have contracted BIA-funded and IHS funded programs and receive funds and authority to administer these programs. First, we urge the subcommittee to direct the BIA IHS to re-examine outdated funding formulas, direct these agencies to develop and implement more transparent formulas in consultation with tribes that consider the geographical challenges that each tribe faces. Second, please decrease agency preference for competitive grants and annual appropriations. Instead, increase the recurring funding for tribal programs that we contract from BIA and IHS under the Indian Self-Determination Act. Third, please increase the funding light items for the BIA accounts, including BIA fish, wildlife, and parks, public safety, and justice, and road maintenance, as I highlight in my written testimony. For example, our fish hatchery Operation has a total budget of $1.2 million annually. That supports 260 lakes with stock, including over 14 million fish, fry, 212,000 fingerlings, including walleye, muskie, brown trout, and perch. The federal funds we receive in our contract with BIA total 503,000. 
This amount represents 46% of the total needs. Please increase the modest BIA Fish Wildlife Parks and TMDP programs within the BIA budgets. Excuse me. Our tribe alone requires an additional four, 432,000 this year to address our current um, full-time employees for our law enforcement program staffing needs to hire and recruit. Two additional officers, one detective, one evidence technician, and two additional surveillance operators. That figure is, represents 95% of all BIA law enforcement funds, $455,000 we receive annually. The, the BIA funding accounts for 17% of our 2.7 million annual law enforcement budget. Narcotics and drugs Crimes are the most significant crimes and public safety problems we face. Meth, heroin, heroin, fentanyl arrests mm -hmm. have exploded in our community. Along with drug-related overdose calls, our officers are called upon to respond. We typically lose our officers when three year, within three years of employment due to existing retirement plan, which cannot compete with outside jurisdictions. We need help. Finally. Please increase the BIA road maintenance program to allow us to purchase and replace outdated heavy maintenance equipment and provide routine and emergency road maintenance services like snow removal, sanding, and salting. It has been over 30 years in, in 1990 since Congress included a significant one-time appropriation increase to the BIA roads maintenance program account to prevent BIA and contracting 638 tribes to upgrade outdated equipment. Thank you again for affording me the time and my tribe for the testimony here today. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I appreciate your testimony. And, uh, you know, it seems like we're, we're uh, there's a common theme run through every, all the testimony that we're hearing uh, from the various tribes about the need to increase law enforcement funding and road maintenance and, and other types of things. So. I appreciate what you what you have to say, and we'll certainly work with you as we try to put together a 2024 budget that isn't ridiculous. That might be hard to do, but we're going to try. <laughs> anyway, Ms. Pingree? I'm going to quote you on that, the not ridiculous part. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Governor. I, I really appreciate your description of the 105L. I've heard you talk about it before, and you're a great, great real proponent and a good example to other tribes of how that can work, so we'll try to continue to increase that funding. and. Um, I thought that was very helpful to hear about the um, public law 280 states where you don't get a minimum for law enforcement. That sounds ridiculous, really. Obviously, they're not going to come in and do the law enforcement if they don't have to. And um, hearing the uh, representation of the family income of 17000 for four, that's just, we all know that's not doable. So my maiden name is Johnson, so I'm on your team. <laughs> just wanted to tell you, you know, a lot of things that are going on up on our neck of the woods also that comes up with this heroin and fentanyl and stuff like that. There's a lot of grandparents raising their grandkids now. Mm -hmm. And you think about the money that they get in, um, is like $3,200 a month, $3,600 a month. It costs $17,000 a year to raise a child. Yeah. And I just wanted to bring that up. So thank you for letting me speak that. Ms. Pingree brings up a really interesting your idea about schools and how to how to an alternative way how to build them and stuff that's fascinating and uh, because I'm all into looking at other ways that might be better to accomplish the same goal so I, I appreciate your testimony I'm going to take a look at that Ms. McCollum thank you I think we started working on that when you became chair of energy and, and water yeah. and, and, and that yeah. and it and it's it's a it's a great solution for some tribes but we also need to fund um, other lines for other 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 tribes. So um, thank you very much um, for uh, for your testimony, Governor. And we we I look I still haven't gotten out to see the schools because of COVID, and so you're on my 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 bucket list to, to see the school. <laughs> but the other thing that this committee helped uh, uh, do is in the bug school, which we're all very familiar with. With right. uh, what we were able to do with um, looking at alternative ways to build, to build faster, to build cheaper. And I want to get back to the bug school, you know, like about six years later and kind of see how it's all holding up. Um, 
but uh, if, if that works and a combination of that, I think we're well on our way to be creative for ways to get schools done faster. Really? Um, so, you know, because even, even if you get the money, you can't let it sit there for year after year after year and just be on a list and keep getting knocked down. Um, that was interesting with what you told me about the, the title records. Um, because I know we were we were working with uh, um, the Bureau of Land Management with some of the tribes with some of their um, the the expertise that was available to them for whether it was oil or coal or natural resource development, but um, just just the the whole issue of of not even having the right equipment. I hope you're not using DOS computers like the Indian Health Service told us one time. So <laughs> so um, we will. Uh, I'm going to look a little more into that and then. Um, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, Gwiflek, is near and dear to my heart, and we need to make sure that, that we fund that because we're the flyaway for so, m for so much, and in the, in the, in the, I know you're feeling it in Maine and in Idaho as well. We're all northern tier states. People look at us and think climate resilience is not a big deal for our lumber, for our fish, for our land, for our water. It is. Our lakes are suffering now because we don't get the same kind of freeze thaw, which is affecting, uh, I, you know, the ice flow affects so much to do with the fish and the, the walleye. And you know, you have your salmon, we have our walleye, um, and purchase good eating too. But thank you for all the work that you do with Gwiflet. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kilmer. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here today, and I don't know what you do with a walleye. I know what you do with a salmon. I, what, is a walleye a fish? Uh. <laughs> so now I can tease her about, I can tease Betty about walleyes and Shelly about potatoes, so we'll sit down and have a walleye and potato dinner one day. <laughs> walleye before the next three tribal yeah. I up. heard the yeah, you're gonna I heard the moan out there now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not only that, Mr. Chair, I know who actually ate the buffalo tongue when we were on a reservation. And yes, you did. did. I didn't, you know did. but you did. Okay. Thank you all for being here today. We appreciate it very much. Yep. Kevin Duprius, uh, Michael Fairbanks, uh, Daryl Seek. Seek. Looks like Seek. That senior. <laughs> Kevin, you're up first. <laughs>
mental health. These are the effects of COVID. And it's affecting any country in a manner that's running wild. Um, in the state of Minnesota, there's approximately 5.7 million people. We make up 1.1% of the population. Every formula that's put into place and at a state level and at a federal level does not include the tribes. I know some are gonna say that's crazy, but when you think about it mathematically, we're not part of the formula. We can't be part of the formula if we only make up 1.1% of the population in the state. But our, our disparities are higher than any ethnic group in the United States. Any ethnic group, our people are dying. And they're dying at rates that we can't control. We have a job as tribal leaders. We're obligated to the ones who came before us to pick up for the fight that they left off to do what we can do today for one simple purpose, and that's to ensure that we have a future of our unborn. And to have a future of our unborn means that we have to maintain our way of life and our belief systems. And to do that, we have to be able to do that in a manner that carries it forward. And a lot of things that have been talked here today, and as simple as appropriation, is meaning that to receive the revenue. Tyson Hill, a brother from Oneida, talked about IHS. Region 5 is the least funded region in the country and it's still the least funded region. Even if we got full funding, which we, we hope, it's about addressing the need so we can eventually address the unmet need. The funding principles do not address the simple need. And the simple need allows us to look into the future to ensure that we have a future for unborn, and that, to me, that is to meet the unmet need. We do not know what the unmet need is yet because we haven't even addressed the need. And it's important that we do these things. It's important that we take a look at it. It's important that the United States, the states, see a people whose lands they sit on are dying in a rate that nobody else is dying in the, state, in the United States. We're the first and we should be the last. Our rates of passing away, our rates of dying, our rates of violence, our rates of suicide, our rates of homelessness, every disparity that you can think in the country, we are higher than everybody else in the country. COVID came, the first call with tribal leaders was to say we want to address the at-risk communities. <laughs> it was never done. But the tribes pulled together in the state of Minnesota. We got together, we talked to each other at 10 o'clock in the morning every day to see what one band or what tribe was doing so we could work together, so we could ensure that we had a safety net for our people. But we always have to do it. If anybody knows how to stretch the dollar, it's the tribes. And by doing, giving us direct funding, it allows us to take care of what we need to take care of. So we can uh, possibly address the need to find out what the unmet need is. And again, I appreciate the time. I'm here representing people. I'm here representing our past, so we have a future for our people. Miigwech. Anin Buju, Anishinaabek. My name is Kawe Gabo. Indigenous cause, Nigizin Judim, Kawa Baga Kenekagan Dunjaba. Miigwech. Thank you, uh, Chairman Simpson and the rest of the committee. You know, I know listening to our, our leadership today and, you know, the panel before us, and I think all of us are on the same kind of tune that funding and allocations and, you know, the, the hardships that we, we have endured through the years of being underfunded. You know, I, I think this is a, a, good, a good day today that we, we testify with, with, with your group of uh, representatives that, that we come here with an open heart and trying to find common ground on how we can solve these, these uh, issues. You know, I know one thing that when I get back home tomorrow, that I'll be going directly to a funeral to my nephew's funeral that who passed away from an overdose. So I know that these, these things hit hard. You know, they, they, back home it's like, you know, we're, we're, we're the biggest reservation in Minnesota and I have a lot of, a lot of members that I have to, uh, to, to talk to and, and communicate back to you too, like every one of us in this room here that we have to address and we have to give our condolences and, and ask them why and ask them, you know, why aren't we helping as a, as a, as a nation 
to to address these these drug issues and I think that's one thing that I didn't really put on my my thing but I think following this and, and listening to everyone's heavy heart that we we talk about this opioid epidemic is something that I really wanted to say today too that White Earth Nation is making a, a hard stance against this and we are you know declaring these emergencies from from for our people so but I guess I'll get back on track now and, and thank you for that and you know what the first thing I wanted to, to mention was our roads department you know back in you know back in uh, 19 or 2003 I know White Earth Nation received over five million dollars for our 150 miles of roads but since then you know I, I know the, the the various acts that came along that they cut us by 70 percent we received 1.4 million dollars for for our roads and I think that's not enough I mean right now we're struggling to to tar our roads to have you know to, to maintenance just to maintenance our, our our dirt roads you know I think this is one issue I think that we've all kind of you heard today too is like that's a huge part of our why I'm all here too is our roads department and the, the next issue I have is in our health, and I talked about the, the, the epidemic with the drugs, but I know the other one is the, the, the IHS funding. Like we talked earlier, 37% of funding that comes through our Midwest region is the lowest funding amount that we have here in, in the Midwest. And, you know, I think that's important that, that we're trying to, to, to pick it up. You know, we're, you know, for ourselves here at White Earth, you know, we have, you know, we have clinics and we have suboxone clinics, and we're doing what we can to to help our people and we're the, the money that we do generate through through our, our billing you know does supplement and does help and we can offer services to our, our, our ones that are sick out there so I know that that's a huge part of this is to keep that funding mandatory that we get that money so and also include the, the, the contract support costs with that too The next issue I have is, of course, well, I think a lot of us in this room, when we had a meeting today with other tribal leaders across Minnesota, is the four walls. And I think that's when I, I you know, I did talk to some, some of our representatives from Minnesota about this, that this is a very, you know, coming down to, you know, after May 11th, we have nine months to figure it out. So I think that's one thing that I think all the leadership from Minnesota here is we were on a call today with that, with with our health directors on how we're going to uh, address this four walls issue too. So I think that's something that I think that we're going to have to revisit and come back and and hopefully, you know, that Congress has a plan for us and, you know, we're working with our state. Our state is really beneficial to us. They're helping us, you know, but I mean, this is something that I think that could be an easy, easy fix at, that at the national level too. So I really, really addressing this to, to, to this committee that you take a look at four walls too, so. And I guess the last thing I wanna talk about is one of the things that, you know, we brought up, in the, that we brought up here not too long ago was, was getting back some of this, um, our, our Tamarack National Refuge back home is, you know, we, there's a lot of history with Tamarack and, you know, when we talk about the, the horrible acts that came through back in the 30s, the Nelson Act, these other acts that were behind it that were stealing our land from us and, Tamarack kind of falls into that into that where where there is our lands that were kind of uh, desecrated and also that were taken from us and I know that we're, we're we are as as a nation we are reaching out to Fish and Wildlife and Department of Interior to work with us you know maybe it could be a, a fix at the interior but I mean we're we're taking a you know we look at this and you know if we look at if we look at the history and I, I gave you the the handout on that that just a history of it's just kind of like, it, each like kind of set precedence with uh, with the U.S. Forest Service when they're given back 13.6 thousand acres. So it's something I hopefully that you can look at and and we initiated those talks with uh, the National Fish and Wildlife with the local agency yesterday. So we are starting those talks with them. So and I know that one thing that when when we get these parks back. I believe that us as stewards of the land, we know how to take care of our land because we do have wild rice lakes in that refuge that we take to heart that we, we, we know how to take care of our water. You know, I appreciate it and I, I really appreciate the members of this, this committee for listening to me and, and I appreciate that, that, that you can work with us. So, miigwech, miu. Oh,
Now I'll speak in my second language. Good afternoon, Chair S Simpson and the rest of the staff and our friend, Betty McCollum. Be good for being here and listening to us. And it's an honor for me to be here to present our, our testimony. I am Daryl Siki, Senior Chairman of the Red Lake Nation. Chimigwech for this opportunity to testify today. This is my third term as chairman. I'm proud to say this subcommittee has always worked as a bipartisan manner to do the best they can for the Indian country. And I believe all of you to continue this tradition. Today I want to talk about four appropriations requests. These funding requests would help improve the lives of Red Lake's 16,650 members. First, we request additional 49 million for tribal law enforcement operations, 22 million for detention operations, and 4 million specifically for Red Lake law enforcement. Red Lake is in the midst of an opiate crisis spurred by non-drug dealers. Red Lake law enforcement is doing their best, but they are hamstrung by two things. One, our BIA funding is way too low. Our BIA public safety expenditures were five million more than BIA provided. Two, we've been hamstrung by the Supreme Court decision that tribal police cannot arrest, detain non-Indians. The drug dealers know this and they keep coming back to this reservation. Congress needs to authorize tribal police to arrest, detain non-members, non drug dealers, the Oliphant fix, because over 130 members of ours died from these fentanyl drugs that are brought by non-members. Something needs to be done. I keep saying that and every time I talk to the feds or the state, we're not a 280 tribe, but yet we need help get that fixed so we can prosecute these non-members that come to our reservation and do what you guys are supposed to be doing, saving lives of our people. Second, we request that you fully fund, make permanent, expand BIA's Tiwahi recidivism reduction initiatives. Tiwahi addresses many vital needs in our community. It has helped strengthen youth suicide prevention efforts, made it possible for our Children's Healing Center to implement a 24-7 youth residential treatment program for rehabilitative mental health, substance abuse services, and combat tribal member unemployment rates by providing classes, training, and workforce development programs. We ask that you provide the additional Tewahi funding in FY 2024, including eight million for healing and wellness courts. Third, we request that you direct BIA to ensure that self-governance tribes, including Red Lake that operates natural resources, tribal management, development programs known as TMDP are included in any increases Congress. In FYI 2023, you provided a three million increase to TMDP, but BIA left Red Lake out of this funding. Fourth, you must direct the IHS to, to meet, immediately include both depreciation principal and interest payments for eligible facilities, just as BIA does. The BIA correctly reads the section 105L statute, which requires the payment of debt service obligation, both principal and interest, as well as depreciation. In 2021, the IHS would only allow depreciation, not principal and interest. Then in 2022, IHS reversed course and allowed principal and interest payments, but not depreciation. We need to help us hold IHS accountable to the law. In my hand, I have the Red Lake Nation treaties and agreements outlining the federal trust responsibility to the tribes. You must continue to enforce these agreements. And the United States Constitution in my hand states on Article 6, the treaties were adopted on the United States Constitution. The federal government and the states have trust responsibility to the tribes for the welfare, the safety, and health for the people of, of all tribes, not just Red Lake, but everyone. And I want to say to me, for allowing me to speak for all the things I present, but five minutes is not enough. We need more time to, to address this 
this subcommittee, and uh, I'm glad that I was allowed to speak again. I didn't have enough time. I had to cut my because the red light came on. But anyway, I want to say to and yeah. thank you. <laughs> By the way, Chair Simpson, we got the be walleye is the best fish to eat, and we have the best walleye in the whole world. You, you, they, they get big. Oh yeah, the biggest. It's like this. Don't hit me, Gary. <laughs> I got a you want to buy some? <laughs> I got a 31 pound Chinook salmon on my wall in my office. And yeah, you that's can a sell big some. fish. <laughs> anyway, thank you all uh, for your testimony. We appreciate it. Uh, you know, Kevin, you said uh, that you have an obligation to carry out the wishes of your forefathers, something along those lines, or to, to yes, abide by the wishes of your forefathers or the obligations of your forefathers. We have that same obligation. And that's called meeting the treaty obligations that uh, oh. we have made in this country over the years that we haven't done. Uh, so you guys going to start doing it tomorrow? Uh, we're going to start. Well, we've been working on it. We've been working on it for a number of years, and it's moving toward meeting those obligations that we're interested in. So, you know, we wish we could do it tomorrow. As long as we're moving in the right direction. Somebody once told me it doesn't matter what uh, where you stand. What matters is what direction you're headed. So, Miigwech for that, uh, Chairman. But can I make a comment to that? And we do understand that. And we do know that. Yeah, I know. But 530 years is a long time, and we don't want it to have 530 years to reverse that. I agree fully. So, Miigwech, thank you. Ms. Pingree. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for your testimony, um, and I appreciate all of the comments that you made. I mentioned this earlier, Betty is the true Minnesotan, and we're so glad to have her on the committee, but I was also born in Minnesota, spent a lot of my childhood growing up uh, on a lake cabin around Brainerd, so very familiar with it, where all of you come from, and my family sends me a big bag of tribal wild rice every year, and I, I depend on that. So um, I'm very interested in all the concerns that you brought up today, and hopefully sometime when I'm home visiting my family, I'll get to visit. Now I know the challenge. We've got two Minnesotans here. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> McCollum? And the wild rice from every tribe in Minnesota tastes really good. I've never done a blind tasting test, but I love it all. So I don't have favorites when it comes to <laughs> wild rice. But I do when it comes to fish, walleye. <laughs> um, uh, to the chairman of Fond du Lac, um, one of the things that really has stayed with me the entire time last time I was at the reservation is when I was looking at the water bottle, bottle facility that's right outside of your travel chambers. And so treaties matter, getting things right matters. So when you are in Fond du Lac's travel facility, you walk right outside and I won't mention the company because I'm not gonna give them any advertising. Uh, there's a company that, that bottles water and they're denied access to um, a, a lake, a beautiful lake or right, right by them, it's all privately held. And it goes back to the Nelson Act and, and some of the other things that, that happened where um, lumber barons here came in and got Congress to allow subdivision of property and Red Lake was the one, one tribal nation that, that, didn't, that didn't do that. So thank, thank you, I, I want you to know that that's a powerful memory with me and thank you for sharing from the heart. Um, I would like you, Chairman Fairbanks, to explain to the committee why it's important for wild rice beds in the Tamarack region and how you have to get in a lottery, basically, to harvest wild rice that's in uh, it's Minnesota's checkerboard in this. I was just shocked that Fish and Wildlife make you go in a lottery, and I hope Fish and Wildlife is listening. Yeah, I mean, that's something that uh, I think the, the, tr the tribal nation and, and Fish and Wildlife, you know, I know that that's one part of the, the, the lottery system is I know that when we talked to them yesterday that we talked about the, the, the maintenance of the, just the levels of, of the lakes themselves that we have to have at a certain level. Otherwise, if we get too much water, it gets uprooted, then we don't have a crop. And I know, I know all the, the leaders from Minnesota understand what I'm talking about, but the lottery system itself is something that where the, the racers themselves have to sign up to, to get in this, into this lottery to, to be one of the few that get to, get to race on the, on the lakes and in the, in the refuge. So that's one thing. So. Non-tribal members sign up? 
Uh, I don't. I don't believe not so. No, no, I don't no, think you have so. To be a yeah. But it's, it's still a lottery system, nail yes. biting, and everything else, and yeah. and, and that. Um, and Chairman, see, I always learn from you, and so now I've learned to learn about depreciation, interest, all that other kind of stuff. So I'm going to go to school on that. You always teach me something new, and I'm so glad that uh, that you do every time I meet you. So thank you. Mm -hmm. You're good. And I just want to put in a plug for the state of Minnesota. We're not perfect as a state, but the state has taken great strides, great strides over several different governors. Um, but right now, our lieutenant governor is a tribally enrolled member. And um, we have tribally enrolled members serving in our state legislature. And it has made a difference. It made a difference in how COVID was administered with, I was on the phone calls with the state of Minnesota and the tribes still had work to do, still wasn't perfect, um, but we're learning learning from that. The state of Minnesota is discussing how to support schools right now because we know the shortage and we know that they're our future. And I was just with the humanities um, folks from Minnesota and they have a brochure called My Treaties Matter, which you're part of. And uh, it's going to teach, uh, as a social studies teacher, it's going to, it's going to teach um, why treaties matter and it's going to treat dignity and respect and the wrong that was done to the tribes there. So um, as things are different in different states, I'm glad Minnesota's stepping forward, but I'm here to say we need to do our tribal responsibility. McWitch. Mr. Kilmer. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just say I appreciate your statement in terms of having the federal government step up and meet its treaty obligations. Uh, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights did an update to its broken promises, uh, to its um, quiet crisis report called the Broken Promises Report, mm -hmm. and laid out stuff that Congress ought to do. Um, we turned that into a bill called the Honoring Our Promises to Native Nations Act to step up with funding, and I um, just uh, commend it to you, and I commend it to my colleagues. So glad I yield back. You yield back. I called on you because you're a salmon person. And we got a little debate going here about salmon and walleye, and I wanted some support. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Chairman Simpson and, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is uh, Ed Johnstone. I'm a Quinault tribal member and I'm the chair of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. Northwest Indian Fish Commission was formed shortly after the United States versus Washington court case, um, commonly known as the Bolt decision. Um, our tribal leaders uh, knew that in that court case which affirmed our off-reservation fishing rights was important and we looked at the court case and w so we created the Northwest Indian Fish Commission in 1974. That, that decision was affirmed by the Supreme Court in 1979. I'm, I'm honored to be here and represent the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. Um, the People that have done this work around this table before me are, are instrumental in, in working with Congress and working with you <coughs> folks to tell our story about the Indian people of the Pacific Northwest who signed those treaties in 1854, 1855, the Stevens Treaties. 
and what it means to us are, are, are salmon people to our culture and way of life that we view things in a different manner. We're holistic, that everything is connected. And to listen to the tribal leaders before me, that's telling the story of us, us Indian people, as Billy Frank Jr. would say. Um, and we've ex we experience all of that when I hear this, um, the health and so forth, and what it, what it is to COVID. What it is to COVID when I worked with a young man for 32 years, two doors down from me, but I walked in one night and late, and he, he said, hey boss, and scared me. I was after um, paperwork, and so was he. Within a week, he had died. He had visited his mother on the Muckleshoot Reservation, caught COVID over Thanksgiving. She died a week before him. These are the st stories of us Indian people and, and the needs that we have. We have that great need here in Indian country and the Northwest in our salmon and our salmon story. It's in our testimony, um, in our background. And, and um, a lot of what you're hearing here is cultural identity. Our people, our salmon people, our young people are losing that cultural identity and, and the connection to who we are through our fishing, fishing rights, hunting and gathering. All those things that you see in the, in the testimony in the different areas talk about, you know, fish and wildlife, the parks, the forest service, national parks, uh, anywhere that we're connected in, in these, the, the story of our funding are important because that talks about our access and our availability. And you know, when a young lady that sits on council for the Stillaguamish tribe, who's a young lady that for over 30 years, Stillaguamish have not fished. She fights every day for that right, that she's never been able to do it herself, nor are those waiting and the young ones don't really know or understand because they don't have the access and so we're talking about Puget Sound and listed stocks and recovery. Things like the Pacific uh, uh, Salmon Funds, either through the PFN, PSC, Pacific Salmon Treaty and PSC, uh, Puget Sound through the Puget Sound funding, all of these different funding sources that you see in, uh, in our funding request are key to us tribes in those rebuilding process to do the work. We, we know how to do that work. We, we put the data together. We own the Bible that said, you know, the recovery plans on every watershed of the 20 member tribes, we have that. That's what everybody goes to. It describes how to rebuild those stocks or protect them. So it's all threaded in the information. So I'm, I'm here to bring that message as short as it might be to answer questions, but we're, we're very appreciative of this committee. Um, we've, we've come a long ways in understanding. Some of you have been around this table for a long time, and uh, that's my congressman from the sixth on the end, who we've always appreciated uh, working with and, and listening to who we are as Indian people, but we're losing our identity, and then you get the rest of what happens when that happens. Uh, I work often with the Alaskan natives, and, and that is very much evident up in Alaska. So with that, I'll close and, uh, and Thank just you. wait for remarks. Thank you, Edward. Ron, you're next. Uh, good afternoon. Long time since show band when we were wandering around in the background and we ran into each other. Yep. <laughs> a, little, a little long time ago, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you guys for allowing us to be here to testify today. And I appreciate my staff because they, they did an excellent job with preparing the um, written testimony that you guys each have. And they also did a good job with my oral te uh, testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Simpson, ranking member Pengree, and members of 
the subcommittee. My name is Ron Seppa, and I have the honor of serving as chair of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, or Quick Fix. Um, I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Oregon. Quick Fix was founded in 1977 by the four Columbia River Treaty Tribes, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation, Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation, and the Desperse Tribe. Crick Fick provides coordination and technical assistance to these tribes in re regional, national, and international efforts to protect and restore our shared salmon, steelhead, Pacific lamprey, and white sturgeon resources and the habitat upon which these species depend. Crickfic works is critically important. That is why I appreciate the opportunity to share our funded priorities with you today. Collectively, the priorities ensure that we are able to continue exercising our treaty reserve right to harvest fish on the Columbia River. First, um, Quick Fix requests $5 million to fund implementation of the Columbia River in lieu and Treaty Fishing Access Site Improvement Act. This 2019 Act recognized the failing conditions of fishing access sites with Congress authorized $11 million to refurbish the site to meet human health and safety standards. The assessment of the site was completed in 2022. The additional funds will ensure architect design and initial construction continues to successfully implement the act. Second, Crick Fick urges the subcommittee to provide funding for Columbia River fishing access site operation and ma uh, maintenance. BIA contracts with Crick Fick to provide these services beginning in fiscal year 2022. Congress provided $1.7 million uh, for this program. We ask that the subcommittee continue to fund these costs for tribal member health and safety. Third, Crick Fick asked the subcommittee to increase funding for law enforcement at Columbia River in lieu sites. Crick Fick appreciate the additional appropriations that were provided previously to enhance public safety and law enforcement services. Crick Fick conservation and criminal enforcement officers patrol 150 miles of the Columbia River in Oregon and Washington, providing policing services at 31 fishing access sites. Continued annual increases are important for retention and long-term stability of public safety. Fourth, Quick Fix requests subcommittee provide 624,000 in additional funding for Columbia River fisheries management. Funded shortfalls prohibit the achievement of tribal self-determination goals for fishing management, ESA recovery efforts protecting non-listed species, conservation enforcement, harvest monitoring, and increased funding would allow Crick Fick to make core fishery efforts and maximize habitat management in, in the Columbia Basin. Next, Crick Fick urges subcommittee to provide funding for youth program initiatives. Crick Fick strives to build a tribal workforce of skilled Native American scientists, policy analysis, technician, managers that will serve tribes, fisheries, and natural resources management needs. Without that increase, Crick Fick and the member tribes may have to reduce youth programming that enhances career readiness and workforce development. Next, Crick Fick encourages the subcommittee to increase funding for Columbia River Treaty uh, modernization. Rights protection implementation supports Crick Fick participation in the negotiations to modernize the Columbia River Treaty. Crick Fick urges 
ecosystem function as a third primary purpose of that treaty. In closing, I'd like to thank, thank you for listening today, and we appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to participate in this forum. Thank you. Bonjour, miigwech. Um, I'm Ann McCammon Soltis. I'm the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, or GLIFWIC, as we call ourselves. The chair of our board, Jim Williams, who also is the chair of the Lac Vue Band of Chippewa, regrets that he could not be here today to speak to you, but I appreciate the opportunity to testify. So my testimony is going to focus on rights protection implementation within the BIA's budget mm -hmm. and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative within the EPA's budget, two very important line items to us. As you might recall from our testimony in previous years, we're an intertribal natural resource agency of 11 tribes that have reservations in what is now Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. These tribes sold or ceded millions of acres, tens of millions of acres, um, of land in those states through treaties in the, with the federal government in the mid-1800s. In exchange, they reserved their right to continue to live their life way on those lands by hunting, fishing, and gathering within the ceded territory. Court cases in the late 20th century reaffirmed the right of our member tribes to govern their members in the exercise of their rights by passing their own laws and enforcing those laws against tribal members into tribal courts. Because the rights are shared by multiple tribes, they created Glyphwick in 1984 to help ensure that federal court orders were being properly implemented through intertribal coordination, cooperation, and management. Our full-time staff numbers around 75, doubling with part-time help during the spring fishing season when they take all those very tasty walleye. We have conservation officers that patrol the ceded territory and cite tribal members into tribal courts for violations of tribal law. We employ biologists, public information staff, and experts in language and traditional knowledge. And this traditional knowledge really embraces a worldview um, in, which human, in which all beings, humans and non-human, are interdependent, related, and deserving of our respect. And I think you've heard that from many of the panelists who've spoken today. Glyphwick appreciates the bipartisan support that our programs have received from this subcommittee over the past 30 years. We believe that our programs are a good use of taxpayer dollars, one that is efficient, effective, and takes place at the most local unit of government that is appropriate, which is the intertribal level. We greatly appreciate the increase in RPI funding that we received in 2023, and as we committed to do in our testimony last year, we've used the increase to bring our pay scale up from the 2018 GS level to the 2023 GS level, which has, is wonderful. Unfortunately, we still can't afford to pay our employees at salaries commensurate with their state and federal counterparts. And unfortunately, this led to us being able to not to, f not to fill three conservation officer positions, which is 17% of our conservation officer workforce. We did not receive any qualified candidates. Um, which was unfortunate, and we really attribute that in, to the fact that we just can't match the salaries that they can get at the DNR or at the Fish and Wildlife Service. But any, um, any increase that Congress might choose to provide for us um, would go toward remedying that situation. And I would just note, we do not get any separate law enforcement funding. It all comes through our rights protection implementation budget, so that's really the only source that we have for, for law enforcement. I've worked for, with federal agencies for, well, as you can see by the color of my hair, 30 years now. <laughs> and really, um, I think it's kind of an unprecedented time right now in, the, in many federal agencies' commitment to listen to tribes and to talk with tribes and to consult with tribes and to take things like traditional knowledge seriously. I think there are tremendous opportunities right now to advance tribal interests and really engage the federal government but I keep saying to people, it's a little bit like trying to drink from the proverbial fire hose. There are a lot of federal agencies that have a lot of people working for them, and we've got 75. Um, we are very thankful that our RPI-based budget has allowed us to embrace those opportunities as much as we can. We're doing our best and expand on them by educating agencies about tribal culture, worldview, and knowledge. And, you know, it, these those perspectives benefit everybody, not just tribal members. 
the benefits of our programs go beyond just tribal membership in other ways. Our conservation enforcement staff are often called on as members of our local and very rural enforcement community to rescue stranded ice fishermen and to search for missing people and to do all those things that you know all law enforcement agencies are called upon to do when you don't have a lot of them and they're spread pretty thin. The other program I'd like to briefly address though is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which it would be hard to overstate the importance of that program to our member tribes that have treaty rights in the Great Lakes. Um, this committee has been very supportive of and we've worked with EPA staff to develop and implement a distinct tribal program, the DTP as we call it, that directs funding to EPA for further distribution to the tribes through Self-Determination Act contracting mechanisms, which has re been really huge. This has increased the flexibility that our member tribes have um, and provided certainty. Um, we'd just like to ensure that as the GLRI receives increases, so does the DTP. EPA has been a very committed and willing partner that's provided those increases and we just wanna ensure that they're codified so that they're not at the whim of one particular person. I see that my time has run out, so I will just say miigwetch. Thank you for listening to me, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, committee members, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so I'm Ron Allen. Uh, I'm the chair for the Jamestown Skalm Tribe, located uh, about 60 miles west of Seattle. Um, I come here carrying um, uh, a couple of different hats that, that, that are criti critically important to us. One of those hats better be the chairman of the board. They are, <laughs> I am a commissioner representing the 25 tribes that, that are part of the U.S. Canada Pacific Salmon. Our, our um, charge is to manage the harvest management um, from Alaska through British Columbia down the coast into the Puget Sound and up the Columbia River, trying to get by a few dams up the Snake River. I, yeah. You might have heard about them. Yeah. Um, so um, it, it is a, a very challenging uh, job for our tribes uh, to engage with our state counterparts, our federal counterparts, and of course our, our Canadian counterparts. It's a, a very complicated world for us and, and uh, um, in uh, the models that we have to we have to model the way we have to analyze uh, uh, the status of the stocks, et cetera, to come up with who gets to catch what and how much uh, uh, all up and down the coast. It, and so, what we're asking for in that venue is that in the right protection, there are about 7.1 million for the 25 tribes to do our job with regard to that international forum. And so we're urging that that get uh, bumped up to uh, eight million um, to help us deal with the, with the complicated issues, including uh, really in the near, very near future, we will be renegotiating these uh, annexes and in the chapters um, that uh, oversee all the species from Chinook, Coho, Chum, Sockeye, et cetera. So that's a, that's a very challenging uh, uh, job for us. I do want to say as a chairman, um, we fully support the National Congress of American Indians, the National Indian Health Board, the affiliated tribes. They all made strong recommendations to you categorically across the Indian programs uh, for Interior and over in IHS. Um, so um, we deeply appreciate their recommendations. I also am the chair of the BIA uh, um, in Interior TBIC uh, Tribal Advisory Com Committee. So all these conversations that you heard from your previous panels and the, all the whether it's road, road maintenance, public safety issues, natural resource management, all the issues that the Bureau of Indian Affairs has to manage with the, in helping tribes uh, elevate their sovereignty and their self-governing uh, authority. So th they're uh, very important agendas for us. One of them is uh, an initiative that has been active now for 30 years, it's called the self-governance movement. And self-governance is about the tribes negotiating their fair share of federal systems and, and taking over those federal functions and moving them out into our backyard so that we can manage those limited dollars that tribes receive from the federal government, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs or Indian Health Service, and make them more successful. We're urging you to establish a, the, the monies that go into the, the, the program that manages that program is called the self-governance office. It's inside the executive um, section of the budget. And so we would like to get a special line item for it because it covers a lot of responsibilities 
who's to administer the, the 388 tribes that are actually currently participating and growing every year. So that, that is a huge issue for us, and, and we urge you to seriously consider that. We fight for those monies, you know, in terms of administering it. We're in the middle of, of negotiating the, uh, the negotiated rulemaking for the Progress Act, which, which extends to Title IV to be consistent with Title V. Title V is IHS. And uh, unfortunately, when that was passed, COVID happened, and we end up with this problem um, in terms of the, the, the authorization in that act to, to negotiate rulemaking. And we're hopeful that you might be able to help us solve that problem. All we're looking for is an extension. Very complicated, uh, every one of those sections of the regu regulations. So um, that would be very helpful for us as we move that agenda forward. We're making decent progress, but uh, April 21 is when the, when the authorization of the, of the administration ceases, and we need to fix that and, and move that agenda forward. So, but the self-governance line item is, is a critical issue for us as well. The last thing I want to um, emphasize is um, the fish and wildlife. You know, I, I listened to the, to the Great uh, Lakes uh, tribes talking about, you know, the fish and wildlife and the challenges. Um, although I, my tribe happens to be currently negotiating uh, a refuge from fish and wildlife, and it is becoming very successful. So it's, a, it's actually in our backyard right in front of our village, and we want to take it over because we feel that we're as good a steward as anybody out there, including fish and wildlife. And so uh, there are lots of examples of that. There's, a, there's an example up at Boyce Fort in, in Minnesota. There's an example in Kawark up in Alaska, and, and, and my tribe is, going, is joining uh, that effort. The bison range over in Montana with the Salish and Kootenai. And so that, that line item that, that administers those programs, the refuge, et cetera, we really do need some help so that we can, as we negotiate it, we also negotiate the share of, of uh, administering and managing those refuges. And so it, it's a critical issue for us. Uh, the administration currently is advancing this co-management, co-stewardship, which is consistent with our culture about, you know, we're as good as stewards uh, with regard to nature and natural resources as anybody out there. You know, we, we feel that we understood conservation um, way, way before the word emerged in the federal system. So um, it's a big deal to us. So looking for ways to get additional resources into that line item for that uh, would be very helpful for us. Um, outside of that, uh, there, there's just a long list, and you've been listening to it, you know, uh, uh, all day today and, and, and tomorrow. Um, I always want to say thank you for continuing to he have these hearings. We don't get these same opportunities over in the Senate side, so at least somebody is listening to us. Um, I go back to the Sid Yates days. I've been coming here for a lot of years, and so um, I just appreciate these opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I apologize for having to leave a little bit during your uh, testimony, but I uh, just want to reinforce that anything that has to do with salmon uh, is important to us on the East Coast as well, and we understand really the cultural importance and, and economic importance of that to the tribe. And just want to say that you're extremely well represented by Mr. Kilmer, who keeps all of us, uh, all of you in our minds as often as he possibly can. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to give an opportunity to um, Chairman Johnstone or Chairman Allen or both to speak a bit about two programs that get funded through this subcommittee that really matter. One, the BIA rights uh, protection implementation and two, the, uh, the Puget Sound Geographic program. I, I think it would just be helpful to share with the subcommittee how tribes use those dollars, why they're important, how the impact that they have. Th thank you, Congressman. I, I, I would definitely yield to the Chairman Allen. That's who I work for. That's who we represent. Um, Me but too, I'll, I'll by the way. I'll be, Me too. I'll be happy, you know, to help, you know, that conversation, but it's, it's, it, it's hugely important. Number one is the, the salmon. We're, we're salmon people, and I listened to the, the Great Lakes folks and, and talk about walleye, how important walleye is to them. That's, that's who they are, right? That's the fish that sustained them along with the other things that they always have had access to and, the, and, the, and lived off from. That was their subsistence as, as salmon is to us. That, that's, who, that's who we are from, from the salmon uh, in Puget Sound, out the Straits on the Pacific Coast, as well as what other resources they provide to us and for us. So 
you know, right, rights protection, um, Western Washington Bolt, fundamentally is is the base that that Congress came up to came up with after uh, the Bolt decision and the legislation that put us in the base. That's where we started, uh, and back then that was um, reflective of what we knew at that time in those court cases, which was U.S. v. Washington. So we built the structure around that to comply with what the judge ruled and conservation and how to manage. And for years and years and years until this committee took it up in 2010, that base had never been adjusted. We went for years and years and for us in the Pacific Coast or in Northwest, then you came along to Hull versus Baldrige. Hull versus Baldrige talked about river by river, run by run and sustainability, but no funding. And then, and then you get the Pacific Salmon Treaty that, that is that recognition between Canada and the United States to bring our fish back to those rivers run by run, accountability to catch all the methodologies and as, as we've gone forward, what, what the coded wire tagging program means to us, all of that data collection identified where our fish are caught, by whom and when, as Ron talks about. And then you come to Rafiti in 92, and another case for, for our shellfish, but does not come with implementation dollars. In 2010, this committee upped it by, I can't remember, $10 million? $10 million. And then that goes to all the treaty areas and, and how that's applied, and we, we did what we did internally at the Fish Commission with the member tribes to, to help step that up. And you saw these duties and responsibilities in these these uh, these uh, graphs, and then you saw in the inflationary dollars, you know, going this way, and so those lines went up while they were going down, mm -hmm. and and so increases are over the long term. I heard heard what we're talking about. We can't just do this overnight, and and but with your help, we've been able to make some steady gains. So critically important, the same, well, same way as in Puget Sound with the multiple amounts of funding that we connect to recovery of salmon in Puget Sound, um, the geographic program and then through uh, Puget Sound partnership, all of these different cells that we work together with moving towards recovery of salmon, recovering of the watersheds to support the recovery of the salmon you know, we're, we're heavily in, embedded in, in climate, climate scientists. We, we recognize that as an organization over a decade ago, prior to climate scientists. Then working through Congress and, and through the whole, you know, even state legislative process to put together climate adaptation plans. And, and they thread all the way into this management, they thread all the way into the recovery plans. I mean, they're, they're very vital, very important. And as we go more in that direction of trying to figure out the work that we were doing under, under the old before climate really became apparent and, and really are, is pressing on us now to do more and to react. And, and um, so much is <coughs> required in data. I mean, it's all embedded in in our test, our test them written testimony, and they it, the, all of them, most all of them intersect. Yeah. I mean, harmful algae bloom in the oceans. The oceans too warm, can't can't harvest. You know, you have to test all the time. They they all are threaded together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't ask any questions because I didn't want to get off on salmon. Uh, <laughs> That's something I've been obviously interested in the last several years, and those of you from the Pacific Northwest know that we put out, oh, about three years ago, a Columbia Basin Initiative to try to restore salmon runs. Uh, Idaho salmon runs particularly interested me because I'm from Idaho, obviously. But they are going to go extinct if we don't do something. And we started off by saying, you know, there's got to be a way to save these dams on the Columbia River and er, on the Lower Snake River and still save these salmon. We couldn't find one. We couldn't find anything that we had not tried 
You know, we've tried everything in the world to try to save these dams and still save these salmon runs, and they continue to decline. And we came to the conclusion the only way, as many fish biologists as all the tribes have, have many other people, that the only way you're going to save these salmon is to remove these dams. That gets a little controversial. And we took a political risk and put out our, our plan and said, you know, let people look at it. And it started a conversation that's got to continue in the Pacific Northwest about how we're going to save them. And this plan became, because th some of the tribes were looking at it as, well, you're talking only about the Idaho salmon runs. Well, we expanded it that we've got to improve the salmon runs throughout the Pacific Northwest. We had money in there and, and programs in there for Puget Sound. We had, you know, for different river basins, whether they were the John Day or the Yakima and that kind of stuff. We've got to improve them always. But everybody says to me, <laughs> well, we've got to improve the habitat. That's, we, we don't need to take out dams. we just got to improve the habitat. I don't have some of the best pure habitat for salmon in the world, in the lower 48 for sure. It's high, high elevation, cool waters, uh, and all that kind of stuff. We don't need habit. Could we improve the habitat in some place? Probably. That's not what we need because you can have the best habitat in the world. If the fish can't get there, it doesn't matter. I actually had a guy say to me, this guy worked for the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, say to me that, well, how do you know it's the dams that are causing these salmon to go extinct? I said, because if you look at the recovery rates of the John Day or the Yakima, the fish that go to Idaho then have to go over four more dams. The only difference is they go over four more dams, and their SARS rate drops to squat, to extinction levels. And he says, well, maybe it's not the dams. I said, what else is it? He said, it could be the distance they have to swim. And I said to him, so what you're telling me is like in 1940 or 50 when they had hundreds of thousands of fish coming back, somehow those fish knew a secret path that they had to swim less distance than these do now. Well, maybe that wasn't smart. <laughs> Everybody's looking for an excuse. But sometime we're going to have to face it. And if nothing else, we've started a discussion in the Pacific Northwest about what are we going to do about this. So I appreciate all of your work on it. It is, uh, to me, it is the most important issue that I've been working on in Congress in the 24 years I've been here. So look forward to working with you. Mike, Mr. Chairman, I, yes, we agree with you. It, it's the four H's. Yep. It, it is the hydro, it's the habitat, yep. it's, it's the harvest management, it's the hatcheries. Yep. They have to be advanced in balance yep. uh, in order to uh, save, the, save that, that, this particular set of species uh, for the northwest, from Idaho all the way north to Alaska. Yep. And uh, uh, we agree with you. It well, can be done. At, you know, if you look at Puget Sound, it's not, it's not dams that are the challenge for salmon in the Puget Sound. It's habitat. It's Quantum other things. Quantum. It's yeah. habitat and stuff. Yeah. So, I, you know, it, it, you're right. It's all of them right. that we've got to address. In balance and you your initiative is a very aggressive one, but it can be done. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you all for being here today. Look forward to working with you on walleye and salmon. <laughs> Uh, that concludes our uh, testimony for today, so we will restart tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, with the second day. So thank you all for being here. <laughs>